Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. If you have read or seen a production of Shakespeare's Henry VIII, the field of cloth of gold is a plot point in it. The author did take some liberties with the historical record. There are people at his version that were not there. Um, in addition to some other stuff, the field of cloth of gold is kind of a mouthful of a name for an event. It was a summit and a celebration that was held to start what was hoped to be a long-term alliance between France and England. Uh, it's not exactly an unknown piece of history. It comes up sometimes in classes. I feel like I never got a really big discussion of it. Mm -mm, Me neither. I could have maybe not been paying attention that day. That happened sometimes. Um, But some of the details about it are really, really fascinating. So it seems worthy of a discussion about it, even if you have heard of it. In part, too, because some of the most recent scholarship frames things a a little bit differently than it's been discussed for years. This is a tricky one because it is a moment in time that represents so many moving parts and nuances of relationships that we're kind of having to do like the quick and dirty version (laughs) on some of that. So just know we try to cover some of those influences going in. But of course, anything like this that happens, the web that branches out from it historically to touch other things is very intricate. Um, We're going to jump right into it, and first we are going to start with the very briefest of recaps of each of the two monarchs involved to set up how they found themselves at this giant festival-slash-party-slash-tournament in a temporary city in northern France, and we're going to start with Henry VIII. Yeah, so Henry VIII took the throne at the age of 17. That was on April 21st, 1509, when his father, Henry VII, died. Henry VII hadn't exactly been beloved, but he had kept England fairly peaceful after the Wars of the Roses. And then when he died, Henry VIII inherited what was a pretty ideal situation, although he did rebel against having a similar identity to that of his father. Henry VIII was tall at six foot two and also athletic. He loved a good party, and he had very keen designs on France. By the time the Field of Cloth of Gold events took place, Henry had already been recognized by Pope Julius II as King of France. That happened in 1512, after the French King Louis XII had been excommunicated. But after a series of mixed results battles and the rise of Pope Leo X, Louis XII was back in the papacy's good graces, and Henry no longer had the support of the Holy See as the King of France. Henry himself, though, continued to see himself as just that, and he thought he deserved some tribute payments from France. Yeah, there's a a fun thing that didn't make it into the episode that I will talk about in the behind the scenes. But like Henry VIII, Francis I, who was the actual king of France, was considered handsome and charming, and per accounts of the day, having, quote, an air of greatness about him, accompanied with a certain gracious humanity. Francis became king when Louis XII died. He was Louis XII's son-in-law, and he married the predecessor king's daughter, Claude. And just as Henry VIII, he was a young man when this happened, although he was not a teenager. Francis became king of France in 1515 at the age of 20. And he had fought in several battles against the English before he took the throne. And again, like Henry, he had inherited a pretty stable kingdom, skirmishes with the papacy aside. And he was also ambitious, like his English counterpart, although he had designs on gaining land and power primarily from Italy, although other places... Unlike Henry, he moved on this a little faster. He started to achieve his goals pretty quickly. For two men who were in some ways so similar, both leading countries and jockeying for power, it kind of seems like a rivalry was inevitable. And it's often written that the two of them actually kind of admired each other personally, but they would never have admitted as much publicly. So please keep in mind, this is just the broadest discussion of these two monarchs. We're trying to hit the points that are most salient in regard to the field of cloth of gold. 
There were a lot of additional events that took place and colored the way these two men saw each other and a lot of other nuance to how a lot of these events also shaped Europe's political climate in the early 16th century. In 1520, Francis I of France and Henry VIII of England threw an incredibly lavish party together. You will also see this listed as a summit, as a tournament, etc. It was so big and so lavish that it is a noted historical event. And with good reason. This thing lasted two and a half weeks. So for these two people that had a rivalry, how did such a thing happen? To even try to get to a point that England and France would be friends instead of rivals, that seems like it would have taken an immense leap of faith and imagination The Hundred Years' War had lasted from 1337 to 1453. That was followed immediately by England's internal conflict, the Wars of the Roses, starting in 1455. The Wars of the Roses lasted 32 years, and then France had its own domestic problems. The War of the Public Wheel was a conflict between King Louis XI of France and the country's feudal nobles, That took place in 1465 and ended with the crown making concessions to the nobility. A similar struggle for power between the feudal lords and the throne of France took place in 1485, and this time it was complicated by the fact that the king of France at the time was Charles VIII, who was still a teenager. His sister, Anne de Beaujeu, was acting as regent. England and other countries supported this uprising of the nobility, Beyond these wars, there were additional conflicts with other nations and groups all throughout Europe and beyond. So in short, these were two countries that had lived in conflict more or less continuously for as long as anybody who was alive in the early 1500s could remember. Many years ago, we made a joke on the show about how there should be a website that was just, was England at war with France? And tell you yes or no. And then listeners made it. (laughs) Two different listeners made such websites because these are two nations that have often been not in harmony. Being in close proximity made them kind of want things from each other and to have power over one another. And it just, as we, the list that we read is by no means comprehensive. Right. (laughs) There was a lot, a lot, a lot of ongoing conflict. But there were actually a lot of people starting to campaign for peace in the early 16th century. Humanists and philosophers of both countries, as well as others, wrote pamphlets and papers on the matter. But this particular moment of peace was achieved in part because a pope had wanted war with non-Christians. Pope Leo X, who was a Medici by birth, had become increasingly dismayed with the successful military efforts of the Ottoman Empire. And in 1517, he called on Europe's Christian nations to unite against that perceived religious threat. And that meant that the Holy Roman Empire, Spain, Portugal, France, and England all had to stop fighting one another so they could carry out the Pope's plan. The Pope absolutely knew that there had to be clear guidelines for such a union and started creating truce plans in early 1518. This involved a five-year time frame in which the Pope would help the included nations work through all their disputes and rule on any of them as needed. Right up to this point, alliances and treaties were being signed and broken as various leaders sought to shift their positions and gain the most power. Yeah, that five-year thing was kind of like, listen, I know, like, you're not going to be friends forever, but could we for five years agree? that we're going to fight people who aren't Christians for... (laughs) Could we all just table this conflict for five seconds? In late 1518, Cardinal Thomas Wolsey successfully managed to get Europe's Christian superpowers of the time to sign the Treaty of Universal Peace. Wolsey was English and had finagled a great deal of power as an acting representative of the Pope, and he used that power to shift some of the conditions of the treaty that the Pope had laid out with an aim to create a permanent peace rather than the five-year term that Pope Leo had set out. That sounds lovely, but listen, there's always a shady enterprise going on. He was also angling throughout this whole thing to ensure that England came out with more power than anyone else, including 
naming Henry VIII as the arbiter of disputes rather than the Pope, which people actually agreed to. By the time Wolsey was done, there were additional treaties branching off of that main treaty. Those subtreaties established more specific agreements between nations, particularly between England and France. And one part of the agreement was that the kings of England and France would have an in-person meeting to seal the deal and assure one another that they were both all in on the peace plan. Wolsey saw this as a way to make both men leaders to all the Christian nations of Europe as they showed strength through cooperation and established kind of a behavioral model of reconciliation. That meant that this meeting had to be spectacular. Yeah, he does seem to have thought, like, if I can show these two guys being cool with one another, (laughs) other people will want to be cool. (laughs) Uh, That's a bless his heart moment for me. Uh, One of the reasons that the in-person meeting between England and France was arranged was to show very visibly and physically that Francis and Henry were going to be allies. To the exclusion of another young and charismatic ruler of the day, that being Charles V, who had become ruler of the Holy Roman Empire in 1519 and was incidentally Catherine of Aragon's nephew, so kind of related to Henry VIII. There was both statesmanship and ego in the mix. Henry had been jealous of an earlier agreement before the Treaty of Universal Peace in which Francis had allied with the Holy Roman Empire. That was before Charles V. And that had left Henry feeling a little bit isolated and left out. Meanwhile, Francis I had started to feel threatened by the military power that Charles V commanded, so they both thought it would be good for them to be allies (laughs) and leave Charles out. It was due to the transition from Maximilian to Charles V that the meeting of Henry and Francis did not happen for almost two years. They were supposed to have their summit in 1519 after the return of the city of Tournai to France by England, This had happened after a great deal of negotiation. But when Maximilian died, the office of Holy Roman Emperor was filled by election. In addition to Charles V, who was Maximilian's grandson, Francis I and Henry VIII were also candidates. There were seven prince electors from the empire who determined who this successor would be. And this very active rivalry, of course, delayed the meeting of Henry and Francis as agreed to in the terms of the Universal Peace Treaty. Once Charles V was finally selected as successor, things once again started moving forward. Yeah, of Henry VIII and Francis I, Francis was the only one that really had any kind of, like, possible... Um, vote-getting ability. Henry VIII kind of was like, me too, Um, (laughs) throwing himself in as a candidate to run the Holy Roman Empire. We will talk about the preparations involved in readying the chosen locations for royals and their retinues once this whole thing started actually happening. And we're going to do that after we pause for a sponsor break. If you are familiar with your Tudor history, you know that Cardinal Wolsey, of course, famously fell out of favor with the English king when he was unable to get Henry VIII an annulment in 1529. But at the point in time we're discussing here, he was still a trusted ally of the young monarch. He also kind of became the de facto party planner for the field of cloth of gold. In addition to all of the festivities, he had to negotiate and carefully plan things so that neither ruler felt slighted or bested, and that there weren't any ways that either of these two men might suffer public embarrassment. Under Woolsey, each side had their own head of preparations. For France, this was Gaspard de Coligny. That was a military commander of high rank and esteem. And then on the English side, there was Charles Somerset, Earl of Worcester, who was also a decorated war hero. The location for this party, which was billed as a tournament, was carefully chosen through negotiations between these men. This was between the towns of Guine and Ard. The reason it was a tournament was so the two monarchs could show cooperation and might. The tournament aspect was not so that these two men could compete against each other, though. The rules were that they always competed on the same side. 
There had also been a plan laid out to ensure goodwill during the feasts. Each king would sit in the other king's court, although the queens each remained with their respective group. Yeah, there's um, so much that went on just to pick the location, and we'll talk about a little bit of it. Uh, For clarity, you know, uh, Green was still held by England, and there was sort of an English area called the Pale there, and then Ardra was in French territory. And the, the middle, what made the middle was a big deal because nobody... The the actual equidistant center still sat on English territory, and it became a whole thing. Uh, <laughs> this summit event took place from June seventh to June twenty fourth of fifteen twenty. Each king brought six thousand people. That was a number agreed to by both sides, so that neither had more than the other. This feels like when you see kids and they get like fast food with their parents, and you watch them portioning out by counting how many french fries each child has so nobody gets jealous. That's very much what this feels like. (laughs) But 6,000 per person meant that there were more than 12,000 people in attendance for 18 days at this party-slash-tournament-slash-summit, and that, as you can imagine, meant a lot of logistics and temporary infrastructure. All of those people needed to be housed and fed. There needed to be space for all of the various planned events. And this had become so high profile that all of Europe was watching. That 6,000 people per country number is also pretty interesting when you consider the population of each country and the extent of the nobility for each of them. The population of France was about 15 million. England was about 2.5 million. The sizes of their respective nobilities were similarly proportioned, and so that meant that with 6,000 people, Henry's entourage could include a lot more of England's nobility, whereas France had to exclude a lot of theirs. One result was that there were a lot of very high-ranking people in France who found themselves socializing with English attendees who were really pretty far below them in the hierarchy of nobility. Yeah, I read a stat that I didn't, it's kind of impossible to verify that France had about 25,000 noble households at this point. So a lot of them were left out. But this was kind of most of England's nobility. So it was a, a very interesting disparity in that regard. In February of 1520, more than five months before the meeting, things really got underway. There had been a new treaty for each monarch to sign that laid out the specific plans in terms of who was financially responsible for what preparations and what activities would be involved, etc. Henry VIII was to set up his court at Guin, which had been taken by England in the 1300s, at this point, as I said, still under English control. Henry wanted buildings to be constructed around the existing castle at Green that would be available and appropriate for royal visitors. And this uh, ended up being a rather lavish castle. Like, they built a, a whole new little palace, which was described in a contemporary account as, quote, brilliant with kingly pomp. One of the design elements of this palace was a secret passage under the floor that connected the king's chambers with the queen's chambers so that Henry could visit Catherine without anybody knowing their business. I love that little detail. Uh, There were also tents constructed around the castle, and that was where the nobility would stay. The French were headquartered at Ard. The two towns are near the northern coast of France in Pas-de-Calais, close to the English Channel, And the meeting point was to be in between the two of them. The two were less than nine kilometers apart, and this was at the village of Ballingham. The camp for the King of France at Ardra required a whole lot of work. Ardra had been damaged over the years in military battles, kind of leading right up to when this meeting happened, and the castle needed a lot of repair. Additionally, tents were brought in to help house Francis I's retinue. Military fortifications were also made to the castle and surrounding area, even though this was, ostensibly, to be a peaceful meeting. More than 300 tents were made just for this meeting on the French side, and they were lavish enough that the King of France could stay in them in both style and comfort. So this is not like the tent you would take out for a camping trip. It was a temporary but very beautiful building. 
Additionally, four houses and the town abbey were commandeered for the king. There's actually some debate over uh, whether a house had actually been built from scratch for the proceedings. It's also unclear exactly where King Francis I stayed. But the main tent for the French group was really spectacular. It was 120 feet tall, that's 36.5 meters, and it was decorated with this exquisite blue velvet and cloth of gold. As a quick explainer, in case anyone is wondering what cloth of gold is, it's not a thing I realized was a specific thing (laughs) before reading over this. It is a woven fabric in which the threads that make up the weft of the fabric, those are the ones that go side to side on the loom, those are actually wrapped in gold. This event had a lot of it why it has the name that it does. Yes, yeah. You can, incidentally, still buy cloth of gold. It's very hard to get, and there's a lot of imitation cloth of gold. Uh, Some people in textiles will kind of make the direct line of, like, this is why we have lame. Oh. (laughs) It's because people were trying to make very cheap cloth of gold representatives. Listen, it works for stage. Uh, This entire enterprise for both countries of building these encampments was a huge economic driver for the months that it took to complete the setup. Each of them undertook the setup of the encampments separately. So that meant they each paid for their own stuff and they bolstered the industries of their own countries. And remember, in addition to just the housing that we've been talking about, they had to furnish all of those spaces. They had to provide bedding and dishware. And for the royal household, entire wardrobes had to be planned and constructed and then transported to the site. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about those, but these two kings were very into their clothes, and both of them had a lot of direct say in what they wore for this. There were feasts planned, which meant that not only did ovens have to be built on site, but all of the furniture, the linens, and other accoutrements needed for banquets had to be ready. The two countries shared the expense of the pavilions and other facilities that were used for the tournament activities. In addition to all of the structures, there were food and drink logistics. There needed to be enough beer and wine for everyone to drink, as well as grain, meat, and cooking necessities like seasonings and spices. Every camp managed their own meat supply by traveling with livestock that would be killed and prepared as needed throughout the event. That also meant that there needed to be places for the animals to basically live, to be stored before they were killed. Deer, sheep, poultry, and other livestock traveled across the English Channel or over land through France to get to the summit. These two countries built entire temporary towns just for this two and a half weeks of the tournament and festival. And because of the importance of this moment, no expense was spared. There are very few surviving plans or sketches of the layout of either of the camps. The majority of the information that we have about them is from descriptions. There is also a painting of the English camp, but that painting was commissioned by King Henry VIII, it's believed, uh, and that didn't happen until 25 years later in 1545. It is not an accurate representation, although some of the details of it do definitely align with written accounts, including the lavish golden palace that the King of England had built. And throughout all of this construction, it actually was being done over this entire foundation of risk, not in terms of building structure, but because there was so much back and forth and renegotiation of terms and p- people disagreeing about how all of this was going to play out, that it was always possible at any moment that one of these kings was going to withdraw and refuse the entire meeting. In the last days leading up to the summit, there was ongoing negotiating as Cardinal Wolsey traveled back and forth between the two kings, working out last-minute disputes both about the event and about other issues and just disagreements between the men. A betrothal between the countries was agreed upon, one that had previously been discussed but still needed confirmation. Henry's daughter, Princess Mary, was just four years old at the time and was affirmed as the future wife of Francis I's son, Dauphin Francis. That arrangement would later be retracted, but in the final days of tension before the meeting, it was considered a settled matter. In the days before the official event kicked off, attendees arrived and they settled into their accommodations at the encampments and 
both spontaneous and very official meetings and introductions were conducted among all of these attending nobles. So make no mistake, even though there had been endless discussions about how this entire event was going to play out to ensure equality between Henry and Francis, as an aside, I went with Francis for writing this instead of Francois, because most history books that we have access to list him that way, just in case you're wondering. Um, But even though all of this discussion had gone on to make sure they appeared to be equal, those two men did want to outdo one another in any way they could. And that carried through to their choice of clothing. Henry VIII, who at this point was 28, he was kind of, we, we see paintings of him when he was later in life, usually. At this point, he was kind of like in his young, hot prime. He was married to his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, when this festival was mounted, and he began the festivals in an article of clothing, quote, ribbed with cloth of gold of such shape and making that it was marvelous to behold. Later in the festivities, he is said to have worn a suit of armor that was trimmed with 1,100 pearls and an estimated 2,000 ounces of gold. And according to an account written by a witness, because he had heard that Francis I had a beard, Henry allowed his own beard to grow out. And because his beard was naturally red, it went with his gold everything else. There's more nuance to that story. He had actually promised the French king he would not shave his beard until the two men met. But that's like one of the tales that got told in real time about how this whole thing was going. For his part, Francis I started the proceedings in a garment with swaths of golden embellishment and jewels kind of dripping off him, as well as these white ostrich plumes. We will talk about how the field of cloth of gold began, including some trepidation on both sides, after we get back from a quick sponsor break. So to begin the festivities, the two kings rode toward one another on horseback. This happened sometime between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. on June 7th. You'll see different times of day listed. As each of them set out from their encampment, three cannons were fired, so everyone was aware that they had started. If an onlooker didn't understand the context of this situation, it might very well have appeared that they were charging one another in anticipation of battle. Each of them had a whole procession with them, including infantry and mounted archers. And the exact arrangements of these attendants, like how they were positioned around their monarchs, has been debated for literal centuries. We don't really know. But of course, instead of fighting, as they approached one another, they doffed their caps, dismounted, embraced, and then entered into a gold-draped pavilion built expressly for this opening ceremony meeting. The two kings proclaimed their willingness to adhere to the plan of brotherhood, Exact accounts of what was said in that tent differ. That is one of the things I want to talk about (laughs) in the behind the scenes. But the result of all of this, even though accounts vary, is what mattered. The summit had officially started. The whole thing almost didn't happen, though, because of a bit of confusion as things began. As the processions came into sight of one another, both men were surprised by the size of the other country's group. Both processions stopped briefly, wondering if they'd been duped or lured into some kind of an attack. Each king needed to be reassured by an advisor that everything was fine, that it was all proceeding as agreed. (laughs) No, no, that's the same size as your group. I promise, honey, let's go. The tournament aspect of this meeting was very much kind of like military training. Like we said, the two kings were going to be on the same side, so it wasn't serious combat, even though everyone is said to have done their best. Uh, There was a jousting competition, there was a mounted combat tourney, and then there was a competition of combat on foot. So the two kings headed up a team that would take on challengers, and no challenger was turned away, although the number of times each competition could run was limited to eight. That only happened, that limit number, after a lot of negotiating, because initially the plan was, we'll just keep going until everyone has gotten to fight that wants to, but that was not really a tenable plan. Uh, Competitions took place throughout the entire run of the summit, although they did not take place on holy days or feast days. The jousting on June 16th, for example, was, based on record, extremely vigorous. Each king broke more than a dozen lances. Francis I actually received a minor head wound at his temple. 
The Kings had taken more than eight challenges that day because so many men wanted to participate and they both were game to keep going. At the end of the day, Henry and Francis had scored a win. Their numbers were the highest. Henry VIII had a special suit of armor made for the competition that covered his entire body, but was made of narrow plates of steel that were affixed to leather strips. This resulted in a high degree of articulation over a normal suit of armor, and the way that it balanced weight made it more comfortable for the wearer as well. That suit of armor is now part of the collection of the Royal Armories Museum in Leeds. You can see photos of it online. It's clear just how intricate its construction is, even in the pictures. Yeah, they have actually done over the years, I didn't find one for this, but I'm sure there's still some online, um, videos of a, a person wearing that armor and moving to show you just how much freedom of motion is available, which is not normally the case at all with a suit of armor. Uh, There were also entertainments and social events. Musicians played. There were masquerade parties. Apparently, Henry VIII kept trying to fool people, but he was so obviously who he was, even in a costume that (laughs) never worked. And performers would entertain attendees with dance and poetry recitation and other kinds of entertainment. And the clothes became their own entertainment. So we've been talking about them a few times, but each monarch seemed to wear one heavily embroidered and embellished outfit after another. Henry's are generally uh, written about as though they were the more flamboyant, but Francis had his own unique style that I think is kind of cool. Over the course, for example, of the jousting competitions, the clothes that he had had made for those competitions were embroidered with words, and each costume's words built on the previous one until he had assembled through wearing them the poetic line, Heart fastened in pain endless when she delivereth me not of bonds. During the course of the celebration, Henry VIII broke the rules about the monarchs not competing with each other when he challenged Francis to a wrestling match. Henry was intoxicated when he did this and kind of got his tail handed to him. Francis, who Henry had not known was an expert in wrestling, had won the match quickly with a hip throw. This incident showed up in a lot of French accounts characterizing Henry VIII as an oaf, and English accounts generally avoid all mention of it. (laughs) This is an interesting one because it it would have been incredibly embarrassing, but even most French accounts are pretty gracious about saying, oh, he handled the defeat graciously. He got up and went, you know, he allegedly challenged Francis again, and Francis was like, No, dude. Um, (laughs) We don't really know if he had hurt feelings about it. That is not recorded. The second to last day of the summit, during a mass that was given by Wolsey, a massive kite appeared in the sky. And this was a giant hoop kite. So uh, fabric stretched around big hoops, and it was made to look like a beast. Just a matter of some debate. It was long and dragon-like, by many accounts. This has been stated by some to have been a Welsh dragon, which would have been a nod to Henry VIII's ancestry. But it has also been recorded as a salamander, which was Francis I's symbol. In that painting that we mentioned earlier, commissioned by Henry VIII, it is very much a dragon. But as for who knows what it was in the day, no one. Uh, All agreed that it was incredibly impressive, and some accounts even say that it breathed fire. That would lean it over to the Welsh dragon side if those accounts are accurate. So the mythical salamander also has fire (laughs) associated with it, so maybe not. June the 24th was the final day of the gathering, and it was a Sunday. All the competition was complete. That last day included only dining and parties. Awards were given out to tournament prize winners. Henry and Francis had one last private meeting where they said goodbye to one another, and then the summit was considered a great success. You're probably wondering what all of this shenanigans cost. Estimates in recent years regarding what Field of Cloth of Gold celebration would cost in modern currency landed at about $19 million. Currency conversion through time is very inexact, we always say that, so take that number with a grain of salt, but there is no denying that it was incredibly excessive and expensive. We do have some other statistics that do not need to be converted. Uh, Over the course of the event, 29,000 fish, 98,000 eggs, 6,475 birds, 
2,200 sheep and 216,000 gallons of wine were served. 1,700 swords were purchased for the various competitions, as well as armor of both metal and leather for all of the participants. And there had been four forges built near the field of the tournament so that weapons could be serviced as needed throughout. This extravagant event is often described as being ultimately kind of a lot of fuss with no real benefit. It was not the harbinger of an extended period of peace between the two nations as it was billed. Henry, for example, had been having meetings with Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire right before the Field of Cloth of Gold, and the intent always was to jockey for the best possible outcome for himself and England. And even the gestures Francis and Henry showed one another in the weeks leading up to the party kind of seemed like dares to the other to do something equivalent. So, for example, when Henry VIII sent one of his favorite and most trusted confidants, Sir Richard Wingfield, to France as an ambassador, Francis I gave the man the same access to himself and the royal apartments as he had had in England which was unprecedented. And then in response, Henry gave a number of French nobles who were considered hostages in England similar treatment. They became as much a part of hunting parties and banquets as any member of the English court. It's like, oh, you are gracious to my people? Well, I am super gracious to yours. Uh, It's a gracious off. (laughs) Within a month of the Field of Cloth of Gold concluding, Henry had started an alliance with Charles V, which undermined the whole purpose of the Field of Cloth of Gold. The following year, France was at war with the Holy Roman Empire, and when England was officially drawn into the conflict in 1522, it was in support of Charles V, pitting England and France against each other, just like old times. So, so much for all the brotherhood that they talked about (laughs) in this event. After the summit, Henry and Francis did not see each other again for more than 12 years. In 1532, Henry VIII fled to France with Anne Boleyn, asking Francis to intercede with the Pope on their behalf so that Henry could have his marriage to Catherine annulled. Historian Glenn Richardson makes the case in his 2020 book about the event that it had significance despite the way things played out in the aftermath of it, writing, quote, That medieval and Renaissance elites valued theatrical extravagance is beyond doubt, but this was a very different thing from pointless frivolity. By Richardson's reckoning, it was really more than the start of a truce. It offered Europe a moment of hope during a period of crisis and hope that even long-established rivalries might be put aside. Yeah, if you look at it that way, it kind of fulfills Woolsey's hopes that like, no, I'm I'm showing you guys that we can be friends. People can be friends if they choose to. Warring countries can find a path through. There is also, if you look at the way the negotiations played out, each of these men walked into this thinking that they had gotten the upper hand, which is pretty interesting. Uh, Today, the area where the tournament field was located remains undeveloped open land. There is actually a granite marker for it, roughly a mile outside of Ardra. So you can go visit. Some of the exact locations of things are difficult to pin down because, as we said, we, we don't have plans surviving for most of it. And it, surveying would have been very different than anyway to what we understand now. But uh, <laughs> I just can't help but laugh. <laughs> My dudes. Uh, Do you want to hear some listener mail that's very cute? I sure do. This is uh, some of the tail end of the stuff that I physically got from the office. So, And this is one that I I don't know if we have ever read any of Brandy's stuff before. She has sent us many things over the years, which she talks about. Uh, She writes, Dear Holly and Tracy, I would like to start off by wishing you both Aha, a magical Christmas season. And by thanking you for all the knowledge that you pass into the world of podcasting for us listeners to enjoy, we sure did miss a lot in history class. Now, I send you ladies a Christmas card every year, each featuring one of our many pets. This year's highlights, Vegas, my nine-year-old Great Dane. I want to kiss that dog so bad. It's such a cutie pie. I love a Great Dane. Uh, This photo was taken just one week before he had a tennis ball-sized tumor removed from his chest. We did the photo shoot back in February because we were not sure whether or not he would survive surgery. 
We have lost a Great Dane to anesthesia in the past, or if he would be with us for pictures come the appropriate time of year. I'm ecstatic and grateful to say that our Vegas is still with us, as spunky as ever, and still does not act as though he is actually a senior. Speaking of seniors, this brings me to the wallet-sized photo that I have additionally included. Although we are strangers, I have heard both of your lovely voices every week for 10 years, and I feel as though we are friends. I also knew that you ladies would appreciate just how cute this picture is. This is one of our engagement photos from back in May of this year. She wrote this in 2021, so it's last year. My fiancé's dog, Sibby, who was one of the two dogs featured on last year's Christmas card, is 10 years old, and she is actually the reason that we met. She accompanied us on our first date, so we found it quite fitting to have her with us for our engagement photo shoot, which was held at the same location as our first date. I just wanted to share these warm fuzzies with two of my favorite people. Uh, She also included some cat-related gifts. I need to forward some of that parcel to you, Tracy. Um... And she says, may every moment of your holidays be decorated with love and joy, Brandy. Brandy, I I don't know that I've ever mentioned on the show before, but I have always loved your Christmas cards because they are so sweet. There's always a sweet animal in them. And they're just darling pictures that look so joyous and beautiful. Um, So thank you. Thank you. I love that uh, your dog is as much a part of your relationship (laughs) and your engagement uh, as as either of you. And congratulations. I don't know if their engagement has culminated in a wedding yet but um whenever that happens or has happened i hope it was abundant joy uh this is so sweet and i love these and they do make me feel all warm and fuzzy great pictures are really cute um if you would like to write to us unfortunately as we've said we don't have a physical office right now um (laughs) there's a little madness going on but uh so email is the safe bet you could do that at historypodcast at iheartradio.com you can also find us on social media as missed in history and if you have not subscribed to the show yet and you would like to so easy you can do that on the iheartradio app or wherever you listen to your favorite shows Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.